See if I can get that nasty boob off the screen there. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is Drew Curtis, and I run FARC.com. Uh, what I'm going to present today is a little bit more organized than what I did last year, uh, which is basically uh, more uh, observations on the media with some specifics, basically, rather than the uh, normal stuff, uh, which was just goofing around. So, And that's, uh, that's Storm, by the way, <laughs> who had about an hour's worth of nap and is not too excited right now. So the uh, subject of the talk in the, uh, the actual brochure was which will kill us first, the bird flu or uh, Janet Jackson's boob. However, something else happened in between when uh, I came up with that idea and this, which was uh, Dick Cheney shot a guy. You may have heard of that. And uh, it was actually a little bit better because there's uh, lately not been that many specifics about the bird flu in the sense that uh, it, 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 it's still kind of a non-story at this stage in the game. So rather than uh, going with that, it was more easy to take something a little more pointed that was uh, run up and down the uh, media flagpole recently. So uh, what do Dick Cheney's bad aim and uh, Janet Jackson's boob have in common? Mainstream media it has got to sell some ads. And I will connect the two dots here as the talk goes on. So how did uh, Dick Cheney end up in the media for eight days? That's a really good question. Uh, what really happened was, is on February 11, 2006, which was a Saturday, Cheney was out hunting with a uh, friend of his named Harry Whittington, or actually, they said he was a friend of his. The guy's really a uh, big dollar fundraiser with the Republican Party. And uh, if you raise enough money for the Republican Party, you get to go on your shooting trips with Dick Cheney, apparently. Uh, yeah, that's actually really what happened. Uh, and... Uh, so uh, he was out there, and Whittington, who is not much of a hunter, uh, ended up getting himself kind of grazed during the, uh, the hunting accident. Uh, to give you an idea of what was going on there, uh, for those of you, uh, I think a lot of people here are more familiar with firearms than most, but I play soccer on a uh, pretty much a daily basis, and we talk about these things like every single night. And one of the things I discovered was is that people don't really know how shotguns work. And uh, some people are not aware that shotguns take two kinds of ammo. You got slugs, which is bullets, and then you got shot, which is what these guys were using, which is basically a whole bunch of BBs packed in, and the, and the blast comes out in a cone. Uh, what happened with Whittington was he was a little bit too close, and he got caught in the crossfire, got grazed a little bit, kind of on the side of his face. I don't know which side of the face it was exactly, but the point being he wasn't caught dead on. Uh, but at any rate, these things happen. Uh, in fact, uh, my uh, great-grandfather, there's a, a story that's told in the family where uh, one time he was, uh, he was trying to catch a fox that kept on getting into the chicken coop, and so he took a shotgun out one night to uh, try to catch it because he heard a lot of noise in the chicken coop. Opens the door of the chicken coop, thinks he sees the fox, and blows both barrels off and kills all the chickens. <laughs> all of them. No problem at all, because that's how shotgun shot works. It's got such a spread on it, you could wipe out an entire chicken coop with two barrels. That's it. Uh, so, compared to this, I missed this, actually. I was in Vegas. We were having a fart party, and I was drunk. I mean, we had been, we'd started really early in the afternoon. Of course, in Vegas, the Super Bowl starts at around, like, you know, 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So, you know, we'd, we'd started a lot earlier than that. Uh, we were at the Hooters Casino, which is distracting in and of itself. Uh, it was halftime, and, you know, why even bother watching the halftime show? There's nothing really going on there. Most of them have been pretty much in, pretty innocuous. Uh, and Hooters was holding a, a wing-eating contest at the time for the uh, FARC party, and uh, two of the people in it were FARCers, and the third was just some guy that kind of wandered in accidentally. And uh, apparently uh, the, the key there was, I don't know how many of you guys have had Hooters wings or not. They're all right. Uh, but what happened was is that the two Farkers that entered the contest entered it based under the assumption that it would be Hooters hot sauce, which is edible, as opposed to what they actually gave them, which was something like battery acid. <laughs> they made up a special batch to try to kill these guys. So all this stuff is going on, and basically I just completely missed it. So I, but luckily, uh, one of our admins, who's uh, there are three other guys that pick licks aside from me, was watching the Super Bowl end near a computer, saw it, 
and immediately hit the article queue for submissions and somebody had sent it in. So he went ahead and popped it up immediately and it crashed. Because 10,000 people in two seconds went, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> crash. And what happened was is that uh, through the course of the next two hours or so, people continued to submit this link over and over and over again. And Peter would continue to replace the link on the main page with whatever was coming in, because Farkers have got TiVos and they've apparently got screen capture on there. So we got it about 20 times before finally it showed up somewhere that could actually withstand the traffic. So this thing went crashing over and over and over again throughout the afternoon. Uh, it actually ended up being the story that got more clicks on it than anything in the entire year. And uh, considering we were running boobies links on the main page still at the time, that's handsome, let me tell you. <laughs> So, but the question is, is uh, that in relation to the Dick Cheney thing, that ended up staying in the media for not only a good two weeks, but still gets mentioned every year. I think it's going to be one of those annual things that they'll talk about every Super Bowl when it comes around. So the question is, how did that happen? How do, how do things like this end up in the media and stick in there? What's deemed newsworthy? <laughs> the answer is, it's basically something that the public hasn't heard yet that might be interesting to them. Uh, it seems kind of simple. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, most news actually is not very interesting at all and needs a little bit of punching up. What keeps a story in the news past the first mention is something that I've, I've come to term mitigating factors. Stories can't come back around again unless something changes. Media can't write articles that say, nothing's changed, everything's the same. Uh, they've tried it. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, in particular with that uh, the one chick down in Aruba. Uh, they try to trot those out every once in a while. Uh, my opinion on that, the reason that's so popular is because uh, everybody wants to go cover it on location. <laughs> Seriously, I think that's it. Uh, and at any rate, they have run a few articles that say nothing's changed, everything's the same on that. But in general, they can't do that. Uh, I got told this when I was doing the interview circuit, uh, when I started doing it about three years ago, and started calling back places that I hadn't, uh, that I'd already done an interview with, who said, well, are you hyping a book, or is there a movie coming out? And I'm like, no, not really. And they're like, well, we have nothing really that we can talk to you about. Because nothing's changed. So until something actually changes, uh, they pretty much have to go ahead and uh, not cover something. Uh, the only exception would be, and the Aruba thing notwithstanding, uh, is basically when something goes retro, which is basically, wow, we haven't talked about this in three months. Usually to be the year anniversary of the tsunami, or we'll find out when uh, Katrina comes back around, they're like, you know, the where are they now type stories. That's about the only time the media can run another article on the same subject, period. Unless there are mitigating factors. Mitigating factor number one, crime. Crime stories always get two or three mentions. The first one is basically when it occurs. Dumbass shoots friend. That's going to get a mention. Uh, the second time around when it's going to get a media mention, and nothing having changed other than that, is when it goes to court, where they'll do dumbass shoots friend, and then take the original article, copy and paste, and then bug out of the office and go drink for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, it will be almost exactly the same article word for word every single time. Uh, the third time that it will occur, it, maybe, and this is only maybe because sometimes it don't actually, doesn't actually go this far depending on uh, overall interest, is the uh, sentencing phase, where the trial is over, they were found guilty or innocent, and if they're found innocent, by the way, that drops right off the radar. Nobody cares about that. If they're found guilty, they will announce what the, uh, the, the, the sentence was, copy and paste the original article on the back, and, and book it, and they're out of there. And that's basically how the media cycle works for, for crime stuff. Uh, they're usually good for about two or three mentions just based on anybody doing anything, period. Other mitigating factors, celebrity involvement. <laughs> If you shoot a guy, you'll get a passing mention. Maybe. But if Dick Cheney shoots a guy, then that's going to go a little bit farther. Major media firestorm. Uh, next mitigating factor. This one's a little amorphous. is the uh, slow news day. Uh, if nothing is really going on, the more innocuous articles will start occurring at a regular basis in the media. Uh, and a good example of this. Happiest guy about 9-11, Gary Condit. You guys remember Gary Condit? <laughs> Most of you probably forgot it, because so did everybody else right after that happened. But at the time, on 9-10, he was the front page guy, because he supposedly killed one of his aides. Uh, it ended up tur being, turning out that uh, it looks like he didn't do it. Uh, his smarminess was basically distracting everybody. He seemed like a guy who could have done it, but it turned out that it looks like he didn't actually do it. Uh, the other people that were happy about 9-11 were sharks. Uh, it actually is something also that comes around every spring usually, is whenever the uh, first shark attack 
article will occur in the paper, and they'll usually run those all summer. The year 9-11 occurred, it had gotten so bad that nothing had happened the entire summer. They got all the way into September with a shark attack. Uh, and then when that actually occurred, then it dropped right off the radar, never to be seen again until the following year, in about May, when somebody got an armpit off. And these things happen pretty much on a regular basis. By mitigating factors, uh, journalists basically have to use those in order to create news. And I don't necessarily mean by completely making it up, but basically by accentuating things that are not really important. Uh, and it'll occur in uh, longer news events, like our, our main two. <laughs> Cheney ended up shooting a guy during a slow news week. And not only did he shoot a guy on, during a slow news week, but he did it on a Sunday. And this was extremely bad, because if you're going to do something during a slow news week, do it on Friday. Presidential administrations have been known about this for years. Uh, the media has a name for it. I forget what they call it, but it's something akin to like the big information dump. On Friday at about 5 o'clock, anything bad that's happened during the last week, the White House will dump then. Because as far as I can tell, the news media goes home around noon on Friday. They just bug out. They get the hell out of there. So 5 o'clock on Friday, they run it. Nobody's really going to stick around and write an article about it, so they know they can get away with this. And they've been doing it forever. And this isn't just the Bush administration that does it. Clinton administration did it. Bush administration did it. All the way back to when mainstream media tactics were first invented. And I don't know when that was. For all I know, it was George Washington. But they started doing it in order to basically get around the, 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 the slow news week, essentially, to take advantage of the fact that nobody's really going to be excited enough to read the newspaper on Saturday anyways uh, and go from there. So what happened was is that uh, Cheney ended up shooting a guy on a slow news day, and I was asleep. Uh, the news article started coming in on a Sunday. It, the actual event occurred on Saturday, and on Sunday around sometime in the afternoon or so, this thing actually broke. And I was napping. I was out for two hours. And normally what happens on Total Fork, which is our subscription part of the service where you can see all the stuff that gets submitted, uh, they start getting really irritated when a news flash level event occurs and nobody sits one on the main page because people will then continue to submit over and over again. The total farkers who have to sit here and watch this go on and get really irritated by it. And so then they start submitting their own taglines. And uh, I brought a few with me to show you, including one, uh, Cheney Begins Coup. We also have uh, Cheney Shoots Lawyer. Who cares? <laughs> Cheney Drops All Pretenses, Begins Hunting Humans for Sport. <laughs> Cheney Shoots a Man, Heard to Say I Told You I Was Hardcore. Cheney shot a man in Texas just to watch him die. <laughs> Not content with just screwing the common man, Dick Cheney changes his shooting with <laughs> Dick Cheney in a desperate bid to reaffirm GOP's national security credentials caps a bitch. <laughs> Dick Cheney goes hunting for some male bonding, shoots a load at her friend, Snickers, and hands him a towel. <laughs> Cheney exercises his Second Amendment rights all over a 70-year-old man. Cheney, fed up with hospital waiting list, decides to begin harvesting organs on his own. <laughs> VP Cheney hunts down the non-believers. Cheney takes tort reform one step too far. And my favorite, Cheney injures friend in extreme Bukaki incident. <laughs> there were literally 200 of these that kept rolling in the entire afternoon. And oftentimes, uh, when a news flash level event will occur, we'll let it sit. Because we don't need to be the first guys out of the gate. Fark's tag is we need to be funny. And so oftentimes you only have to wait about five minutes or so. Uh, last time we did this was when uh, Duke lost to LSU in the, uh, in the Elite Eight uh, in the NCAA tournament, which was absolutely fantastic, by the way. But I won't talk about that because I can rant on for days. But uh, I knew this was coming, and I was out, and I was drinking. So I couldn't do it myself. And I called our link picker guy, and I said, hey, get ready. Duke's about to lose. And he was watching it because he thought that might happen. And I told him, he's like, so what do you want me to do? And I said, just wait until the funniest one comes in. Give it five minutes. And he did. And uh, basically, the taglines uh, are pretty much what makes Fark. So we have to wait until the, the humor shows up. Luckily, it's in plentiful supply. I mean, literally, this is only like a few of the, the hundreds we've received. So first mitigating factor, the news hits the wires 24 hours after it actually happens. Now, how did this actually occur? Dick Cheney shot a guy on Saturday. The news doesn't hit the wires until Sunday. And the only reason it hit the wires on Sunday was because on Sunday, the owner of the land where this occurred called a buddy of hers over at the Corpus Christi Times news office and said, hey, guess what? Cheney shot a guy. What do you think we ought to do about it? And uh, I don't know if he answered that question or not, but he ran an article out the door pretty quickly. And that's how that came. But here's the, here's the thing. 
When, uh, in order to get confirmation, because reporters, good reporters, don't normally just run with any news that they get off the top of their heads, uh, called Cheney's office for confirmation and got it. Now, here's the key piece. They already knew. Where by the time he called Cheney's office, they were well aware that this had actually occurred. Now, as kind of an aside on this, <laughs> as kind of an aside on this, the media uh, was asking on uh, Monday when they finally got really going, because they all showed up back at work. They really hate coming in on Sundays, and they won't generally do any work. But on Monday, they're ready to go. Uh, Cheney spokesman uh, Leanne McBride was asked at a press conference on Monday whether or not the office had planned to inform the media had the media not contacted them first. McBride didn't answer the question. Now, this actually got an article of itself. Uh, the media went off implying that basically Cheney's office had intended to cover up the incident completely. Now, despite the fact that you could certainly argue that cover-ups are an MO of the Bush administration, in my personal opinion, there's no way that Cheney's office ever intended to cover this thing up. I mean, for one thing, Cheney is a crack marksman. If he'd actually been trying to kill Whittington, he'd be dead. <laughs> you sure as hell wouldn't be using a shot either to do it. The real culprit in this entire thing about where the delay actually occurred was that protocols don't exist for what happens when the vice president shoots a guy. <laughs> the last time it happened was right here. 200 years ago, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton had a duel. Burr killed Hamilton. And uh, it hasn't actually happened yet. Now, administrations do know what to do when somebody shoots an administration official because up until recently, it's happened every 20 years like clockwork since 1840. The sitting president has died that's been elected. Uh, and I, they called it the, uh, what was the name of the curse? the curse? It was an Indian curse. Supposedly an Indian did put a curse on, what was that? Tecumseh's yeah, Tecumseh's curse. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. But it, essentially, uh, every 20 years, the sitting president has died in office. Uh, we still got three years to go. Uh, so the jury's not out on this one. The only guy that ever survived it was Reagan. Uh, which has an interesting little, uh, there's an interesting segue to that coming later on here. Uh, but it, essentially, uh, they do know what to do when that happens. There's protocols, people get contacted, things go into motion. Nobody knows what the hell to do when an administration official shoots somebody else. Hasn't happened. <laughs> the, uh, double checking, I got confused myself on the notes here. The, uh, Interesting thing about this was the, uh, the fact that while you could, like I said, you could say that the MO of the Bush administration was cover-ups, the thing about it was is that uh, this was not really the issue to go after Cheney on, in my opinion. And in fact, in a lot of people's opinions, there were a bunch of bloggers that came out wondering aloud whether or not the media would have pursued the Valerie Plame leak with the same dog and determination. What would have actually occurred? Uh, we may end up still seeing how that goes, but uh, I actually don't have my hopes up for that. <laughs> So here's what happens in the media cycle. So you've got basically something that's occurred. You have no more information about it. But you do know that it's an ongoing story because questions have not been answered. So what do you do? You got to pad the story. You, gotta, you don't make stuff up, but you, you basically you enunciate, you, you basically take, accentuate facts that really aren't that big a deal. Case in point. Monday, February 13th, the media's big deal was that they had found out that Cheney and Whittington, while they had been hunting, had failed to get a $7 hunting license stamp, which allowed you to shoot upland game birds. If you were in Texas and you just get a hunting license, apparently you were not allowed to shoot upland game birds without a $7 stamp. That was the entire article. That was it. Cheney, that cheap bastard had purchased his $125 hunting license, but had not paid $7. Oh, the horror. <laughs> now, that being said, while this is pretty much a non-story, at the same time, there is kind of a story. I don't know how many people in here hunt or fish, but anybody who's had any experience with the wildlife game office knows that if you or I were out hunting without a $7 stamp, they'd throw the book at us. It'd be whatever the highest fine was. However, to that extent... Um, I don't think that the fine for that was all that high, and the reason I don't think so is because nobody mentioned it in any of the articles, and there were plenty written about the fact that Cheney had not had his $7 stamp. Big deal. Uh, except that uh, if, if there was a fine that was significant, they would have mentioned it somewhere in the article. If it had been you know, a bazillion years of jail time or something like that, then it would have shown up, but no, it didn't appear anywhere. Next mitigating factor, on Tuesday, that poor bastard Whittington had a heart attack in the hospital. Potentially related to the fact that he was shot. <laughs> Out came the word processors. They put two or three articles about Whittington had a heart attack in the hospital, copied and pasted the entire article on the back, and went out for a smoke break and probably never came back for the rest of the day.
That's how that ended up working out. Next mitigating factor, beer. Cheney admitted to somebody at some point on Tuesday that they had had a beer. Just one beer. Stop the presses. A beer. Now, never mind the fact that the whole point of hunting is beer. I don't know if you've ever been hunting. <laughs> but hunting is like fishing. And fishing is like golf. And if you've never been golfing, what these activities all have in common is they are really, really boring. <laughs> so you bring beer. Or to basically keep your, uh, keep your interest going. And beer is basically the entire point. But here's the thing. Cheney said he had just one beer. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have friends that are cops. But if you do... And you ask them how it's gone whenever they pulled somebody over and ask them how much they've had to drink, everybody always has just one beer. To which point then they give me a breathalyzer and they blow like a .50. <laughs> Straight up. Just one beer is basically co language saying, we were smashed out of our skulls. I think that's exactly what happened with Cheney. But here's the thing. It's not illegal to drink and shoot. I mean, it's not a good idea. <laughs> But it's not illegal. And mainstream media loves to jump up and down about this stuff. But oh my God, Cheney had a beer. Oh my God. Uh, it isn't necessarily even the fact that Cheney had a beer, but they tried to do, uh, you'll see this most often on local news where they'll do these exposés on college kids drinking where they'll follow these college kids around and they'll go into a bar and they'll drink. Oh my God. Does this actually surprise anybody anymore? The media thinks it does. And so they run these articles. In fact, it got silly to the point where recently this year, they followed a Minneapolis hockey team around. And it only took about 15 minutes before they went in a bar and got stinking drunk. And they had, uh, Fox News team had these hidden cameras where they actually taped hockey players drinking. Go figure. <laughs> the best part about it was, is when they had the coach who issued a press release that basically said, follow any college student around for two weeks, there's nothing on this planet you won't be able to film them doing. <laughs> it's absolutely true. The other uh, thing that ended up in the media as a result of this, it wasn't really necessarily a mitigating factor, but it was a side effect, was is that for that uh, week, any poor bastard that shot another guy, front page news. Including one guy that shot a guy while talking about how stupid it was that Cheney had shot a guy. Like literally in the process of describing what had happened, he shot his buddy. Uh, my personal favorite was an accidental shooting, and I put this in quotes because I, I got to wonder about it. Uh, it, uh, he was shot by his girlfriend. Okay, now that's a little suspicious right there, just in and of itself. Uh, but it gets better. Uh, she was 17, he was 21. All right, now the ick factor already is engaged at this point. And apparently they were tracking a possum around their car, and he was on one side and she was on the other, and their story was is that basically she had the gun on the other side of the car, and he leaned over like this to see if the possum was down there, and she saw his head and shot it. That was the story. <laughs> Personally, I think that, uh, you know, it's one of those things where that can't possibly be a good relationship anyways, and it probably is just one thing leading to another. <laughs> one of the other uh, things that happened that week, and I suspect this was an accident, but I don't know for sure, but it was just, it was just too weird to be, be, you know, anything other than a coincidence. Uh, but there was an article that came out the exact same week on how to properly bury someone in your backyard. <laughs> I swear to God. Now, this article was about bird flu. Uh, why they decided to run up the poll that week, I have no idea. That's uh, one of those articles that was probably what they call in the hopper, which means the media will store these articles about just stuff, hoping that at some point it'll come, become relevant. Um, a good example is, if you ever watched uh, local news when they start talking about the obesity epidemic for whatever reason, look at all this canned footage of fat people walking around the streets. You know, it's like, like that's just like sitting around in some vault somewhere. They've got this ready to roll out the moment in case somebody might start talking about fat people. Well, I suspect this article was written a long time ago and uh, probably completely unrelated came out. Uh, one of the Farkers that read that article about how to properly bury somebody in your backyard had an excellent point. Said, shouldn't this article have been about how to build a funeral pyre in your backyard? Because one of the uh, little bits of gems of information was uh, if you have to bury somebody in your backyard, don't bury them near the septic system. Well done. I mean, come on. You don't have to go too far to figure that one out. Media rules. Uh, I'm working on a book right now about rules in the media, and they're not what you would expect. One of the rules is press releases masquerading as actual articles. Uh, when the media has nothing to go to, they will start running these things up the flagpole as actual news. One of the articles that came out that week uh, was an article by PETA. PETA ran a press release. The media just went ahead and just took it verbatim and ran it out there, uh, denouncing the fact that Cheney was hunting, period, and said, quote, put your guns down and pick up a tennis racket, Mr. Cheney. Copy, paste, print, smoke break, bar. That's how that went. <laughs> Second article that came out that week, which is a press release, was from Sarah and James Brady. 
And I actually have the entire text of it because uh, it's just so astounding to me that this actually made news. Okay, here's the entire article, okay? And I quote, it starts right here. Now I understand why Dick Cheney keeps asking me to go hunting with him, said Jim Brady. I had a friend once who accidentally shot pellets into his dog, and I thought he was an idiot. And then another quote, I thought Cheney was scary for a long time, Sarah Brady said. Now I know I was right to be nervous. That was the entire article. That's it. Ran right out there. End of article. What the hell? <laughs> Your feelings about Sarah James Brady aside, uh, and politics aside, how the hell was that even news? The fact that they ran this up the flagpole. I have no idea. I lost about as much respect for the Bradys when this happened as I did when I saw Jesse Jackson leaping the defense of Terrell Owens over racism allegations. You guys remember Terrell Owens, the uh, guy, uh, well, he's playing for Dallas now. He got signed up in Dallas. T.O.? Yeah, T.O., yeah. He, uh, he was claiming this $15 million crybaby was complaining that the reason he was getting media attention was because of racism, and Jesse Jackson is there. He's ready to jump in. Something's wrong with that guy. Cheney ended this entire affair, at least for his involvement, on uh, February 15th, which was a Wednesday, uh, by doing, finally doing a press conference. But uh, he didn't do a press conference as much as he actually went, just went to Fox News and was interviewed by, with softball questions for about two hours. Now, everybody was up in arms over this, but here's the thing. What really could have come from having an open press conference about this? Okay, the guy actually shot somebody. <laughs> Uh, and that's basically it. Now, the media, however, was loving. They wanted to get him out there and just drag him through the muck. And now, like I'm saying, I'm not saying Cheney's not an asshole. He probably is an asshole. I don't think you can become vice president without being an asshole. But <laughs> it wasn't the time or the place to nail a guy over, you know, what, anything else he might have been doing. If the media really wanted to jump on it, don't wait until he shoots a guy accidentally. Maybe ask some direct questions during a press conference. How about that, guys? Give that a shot. See what happens. Honestly, I think Cheney was probably really upset. It was a good thing that nobody asked him any questions. I mean, for one thing, Whittington was a million-dollar earner for the Republican Party. I mean, you know, he might have killed that guy. An uh, interesting postscript of the entire event was that when Whittington got out of the hospital, he apologized for getting shot. <laughs> Not sure exactly how that would have been his fault. Next media rule, has the media gone too far? This is how you know that the news cycle is about to end when they ask, has the media gone too far? This, by the way, is an actual Time Magazine cover. And they trot this out every single time because once they have nobody else to interview and nothing else to talk about, they like to talk to themselves because it's a lot easier than actually doing work <laughs> and because they're all sitting around. Uh, the most amusing bit I saw on this was it was actually a CNN show. I saw it in an airport, just caught the end of it. CNN's got some kind of a show there on Sundays, and I don't know what it is, but there's a live audience involved in it of about 50 to 100 people there. And they basically, for whatever reason, they go and ask these people what they think, which um, uh, my buddy Brooks, who runs Sports by Brooks, does a lot of radio, and he says that that's actually the worst radio you can do. So the minute you say, let's go to the phones, you're pretty much talking to crackpots <laughs> and nothing but. In this particular case, CNN is a little show. They are inviting people that are out walking around, usually tourists, and so they're probably there for, you know, whatever reason. So they're not necessarily crackpots, but it was interesting that without exception on the subject of the Cheney thing, every single person expressed emotions ranging from mystification as to why this was in the news to disgust that it was in the news, because who cared? And it basically came down to the same conclusion. They're like, there are many more important questions that need to be asked to Cheney other than, how did you shoot this guy? It just isn't that important. Best wrap-up I saw was a follow-up about a day later. It was an entire article coming out of Florida. They're always good for the best stuff. Uh, it was basically uh, Governor Jeb Bush was appearing at the Florida State Fair for a luncheon, and somebody had given him a bright orange sticker to wear out there. And it was like, I guess it was the guys from lobbying group that was doing the, uh, the event in the first place. And, and the, the sticker said, no farmers, no food. Now, that's a great concept right there. Because where the hell else are you going to get the food from? I don't even know why you have to bunch in the first place. But anyway, he said that uh, he, he, his first thing he said, his opening remarks was, he said, I'm a little concerned that Dick Cheney is going to walk in right now. That was it. That was actually the entire article. It took me longer to explain it than it would have taken you to read it. <laughs> That's how ridiculous this thing got as far as that goes. And hey, speaking of ridiculous, let's go back to this. The most outrageous part about this controversy was actually about boobs. It's a part of the female breast about this big. You guys may be aware. The women in the room know exactly what I'm talking about. The men in the room, you know, you may have noticed we have these things too. Uh, not as exciting on us, obviously. But um, given the fact that any broadcast TV audience sees these things, basically half of them see it on a daily basis. Uh, and you can expose on broadcast TV basically every other part of the breast except for a piece of skin this big. 
And you can actually show women taking their shirts off as long as they're not looking that direction. You can also put nipple pokies in your bras. So basically we're talking about you can actually have nipples that are not flesh colored. Uh, something that Jennifer Aniston used to do in the early days of Friends, which may have accounted for all the popularity of that show. <laughs> you can't show a piece of flesh this big. So the question becomes, okay, in general, why did this story receive so much coverage? Well, the only mitigating factor involved here is celebrity involvement. Uh, the only other possible culprit is, is that boobies are fun. And they're fun <laughs> to talk about. And when the media starts talking about boobies or nudity or sex, this Beavis and Butthead thing takes over, where literally, you can almost see them writing and going, ha, 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 while they're working on it. I swear to God. In Europe, no one cares about nipples. They don't care at all. Uh, interesting story. When I was traveling around Europe about three years ago, I went over to visit the offices of Afton Post, and we're, it's in Norway. And in Norway, they've got half-naked chicks hanging up all over the place. I mean, they're on postcards to each other. They just don't care. Just about every single beach in Europe is topless. It's optional topless. It's not like they got guys with guns going, oh, you must take your shirt off, but it's optional. <laughs> and uh, for the most part, it's actually not that good a thing. I don't know how many of you have actually been to topless beaches, but the women that go topless, the women that should not be going topless. <laughs> The BBC wrote an analysis of uh, media quotes soon after this occurred, which had some pretty, uh, pretty good comedy gold. Uh, the start of the article came out, quote, two seconds of bare flesh in America is beside itself with outrage. <laughs> and then they, then they rounded up some quotes on the subject, including a quote uh, by Tommy Lasorda, and it was, this was the most disgusting thing I have ever seen at a sports spectacle. This. Baseball coach Tommy Lasorda. A nipple? I mean, Lasorda apparently doesn't watch Fear Factor. That's all I can figure. <laughs> For those of you guys familiar with that, uh, there is not an episode of Fear Factor that goes by without one of the actual contests being eat these live critters of some kind. Usually insects, sometimes worms, always live critters. One of the Farkers that was making comments about it, uh, it was a Farker named Smite the Righteous, had a great quote. And he said this, he said, A bare breast on national television, America screams, and the FCC demands an investigation the next day. But faulty wartime intelligence, and you've got to practically bribe the government to investigate. Uh, in defense of America, however, a similar controversy erupted uh, when Johnny Rotten said fucking cunt on live TV in the UK, uh, which, was even, which was pretty amusing considering, I don't know if you guys knew who Johnny Rotten is, but just, you know the name, figure it out. Uh, the fact that he hadn't said it, he said this about five episodes in on some kind of a celebrity Big Brother show, the fact that he hadn't said it every single time he opened his mouth <laughs> was the most amazing part of that story. That took up as much time in the UK media as the nipple thing did either. So while they, our fascination with nipples is ridiculous, the, uh, the fact that, they, that this ended up the same thing. Basically, the, Europe has the same weakness as we do. <laughs> now, it turns out that uh, during this exact same Super Bowl, uh, there were uh, all three erectile dysfunction companies ran commercials. One of them sponsored the halftime show. I forget which one it is because they all blend together. Uh, and at least one of the commercials had a, uh, a flatulent horse. That was Bud, actually. Bud, Bud Light or Bud. I don't know which what commercial it was for, but they did it. Um, anyways, uh, the commercials were no less offensive than what was actually going on during the actual uh, spectacle. But here's something else you probably missed. This guy right here, his name is Mark Roberts. He's actually a world-famous streaker, as it turns out, because apparently you can be one. Uh, <laughs> his goal in life is to streak every famous sporting event out there. Uh, this is actually him in one of the golfing tournaments in England, and you can see he's got his little you know, 19th hole thing on. This is actually a real picture. And uh, he was actually at that Super Bowl where, my, where, where Janet Jackson's nipple popped out. He was there, and he streaked it, as it turned out, too. But nobody heard about it for a couple of reasons. One, uh, U.S. media, when they see anything happening on the field that they don't want anybody else doing, uh, will cut away from it. Uh, case in point, it was during a, uh, it was a Kansas City White Sox game, I think it was a few years ago, a very touching father-son event occurred where a father and son jumped the fence and started beating the hell out of the first base umpire. <laughs> Never explained why, but the best part about that was is that it was one of the few times that both benches in a baseball game cleared to beat the same guy up. <laughs> and the video is hysterical because both teams are either just pounding the hell out of this guy. And it's interesting to point out that these guys are actually in jail now. And uh, in the meantime, nobody, no baseball player was charged with anything, even though they had plenty of video. Not that they should be, but I'm just saying it's kind of an interesting thing. At any rate, uh, this guy decided he was going to streak at the beginning of the third quarter. And that's where he went wrong, because at that point, everything was already talking, everybody was talking about the Janet Jackson thing. Uh, and his other problem was, is he went running by the uh, Patriots bench, and Patriots linebacker Mark Chatham saw him going by and put the most vicious hit on a streaker ever. <laughs> 
Roberts had been hired by Golden Palace, the same guys that'll buy anything on eBay with a Virgin Mary on it, or the uh, bathtub that James Earl Ray was standing in when he shot uh, MLK Jr. Roberts was really, really disappointed because basically nobody noticed that he had done this. <laughs> and he was really, really upset about it. Uh, and in fact, what's funny was even his mom was upset about it. <laughs> I guess over the years, if your son's going to, has already streaked 30 major sporting events, you just, you know, you lower your expectation levels, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of a, a side effect story, not necessarily a mitigating factor, but on the Wednesday after the Super Bowl, a woman named Terry Carlin of Knoxville, Tennessee, filed a class action lawsuit against Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake, CBS, MTV, Viacom, and for all I know, God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> she charged that the wardrobe malfunction had injured viewers, irrevocably. The smoking gun had the best riff on it. They said, quote, an exact dollar figure in the lawsuit is not specified, but it seems that billions would be in order since Carlin notes that punitive damages should not exceed the gross revenues of all defendants for the past three years. <laughs> by far the stupidest follow-up that I read was from Florida. Again, shocking. It was an article, it was mostly by local TV guys who were just trying to basically kill time while they're on there, which was talking about how piercings were up since the stunt. <laughs> As if there is some kind of governing body somewhere that tracks this kind of thing. No doubt they basically, they, they, no doubt they called an independent polling company to confirm this as opposed to just completely making this shit up, which is like what I think happened. Incidentally, Janet Jackson appeared topless on an album she released two months later. Shocking. The media furor lasted for about uh, two full weeks after the incident. Like I said, it gets trotted out every single Super Bowl and probably will be for the rest of time. On FARC, after about a week of this stuff, basically every time we posted something, some kind of follow-up, we got so many complaints that I just quit following it because nothing was really happening and they were still just talking about boobs. And they're all, you know, like I said, you can just imagine the whole Beavis and Butthead thing going on in the background. So the conclusion. Why important articles like the Iraq War or Karl Rove potentially leaking information to the media get less proportionate media coverage than Janet Jackson's boob or Dick Cheney shooting a guy? It's a really good question. Uh, for example, the day I was working on this project, 15 people got blown up by a, super, a suicide bomber in Iraq. It actually did make the news, but nobody actually caught it. These things are getting buried on page five all the time. The reason is because we've basically heard it before. Uh, when I was talking about how media can't write articles about stuff that isn't changing, something that's not changing in Iraq is about 15 people are getting killed by a suicide bomber every day. Um, interesting aside to that, uh, one of the charges that have been levied against the Bush administration was the fact that the first day they came in, they were discussing attacking Iraq. Well, the reason they were discussing attacking Iraq was because currently we were dumping war ordinance over Iraq when Clinton left office and Bush showed up on the first day, then we were dumping over Vietnam at any given time during that war. And the reason was they were discussing Iraq was because it was an active war situation. We were bombing people left and right. Now, whether or not there was other shit that went bad, I'm not going to comment on. They leave that to your own conclusion. But I'm just saying that there's a reason that that occurred. And the reason that nobody was aware of it, everybody's probably forgotten at this point, was because it's a daily thing. It's not going to make front page news. We've just dropped more into Iraq. Oh, really, did we? Uh, mostly, if I remember right, they were shooting uh, radar installations that were getting locked on our fighter pilots. That was the main one. Carl Rove actually is the, uh, the master of understanding how the media works. And in particular, what he understands is that if you keep your mouth shut and don't make any comments about anything, the media cannot continue to comment on it, no matter how bad it may be. The validate flame leaks, in my opinion, are pretty serious, and there should be some pretty bad repercussions about it. But that being said, as bad as that is, the media cannot continue to write articles about it if nothing changes. They just can't. Uh, they want to. There's a gentleman back here with some pizza for you. Oh, excellent. I'll take it. All right. Bueno. Who's, who's picking up the tab on this one? Yeah, good question. <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, he understands it, and he understands it by not commenting on something. He's set, and so that's how he gets away with it. Uh, it's also interesting to note along the same uh, lines is that around, uh, thank you very much. Here, hold this. Oh, you're good. <laughs> along the same lines is that it's interesting to note that the media actually slows down around Christmas time. And it, it can't possibly be that there are less things occurring around Christmas time because essentially the same number of events are actually happening. But what's actually occurring down around Christmas time is the fact that there are no media guys working. So all they can do is actually cover the really important thing. And so you don't see stuff about like dogs shooting their owners or crazy cat woman being arrested for about a two-week period because basically everybody's gone. They've got nothing to write about. And that's basically where coming back around to the original problem we have is that the reason that all this stuff actually shows up in the media at all is because they've got to have something in there in order to fill column inches to sell advertising. More unusual topics will basically get more attention. 
less unusual topics will get less attention. Should it concern us that uh, news uh, is directly proportional to the number of journalists at work at any given time? Yeah, I think it should. Any questions? <laughs> That's a lot to digest. Yeah, 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 please, finally, I can't eat all that. That's two pizzas right there. I'm going to have one. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, they kind of get it uh, by virtue of the fact that BBC is covering it. There's actually two reasons for that. One is kind of the way that the, uh, the U.S. media works. Uh, one of the media rules that I didn't talk about here is basically proximity to New York City or L.A. Uh, basically, if anything happens in those two cities, it's much easier to lean out your window and take a uh, picture of it than it is to actually, you know, run down to, say, St. Louis and cover it. great example is, uh, I'm using the book I'm working on, is, is that uh, the 59th Street Bridge had a tarp catch on fire one day. CNBC... Uh, MSNBC, CNN, and Fox all ran a burning tarp on a bridge for two hours live. <laughs> Swear to God. In the meantime, stuff that gets missed is like uh, there was a major chemical plant that blew the hell up in St. Louis, uh, which got practically no coverage. And also, uh, Mount St. Helens blew one of the tallest ash columns that it's blown in like the last 10 years, and nobody caught it because it happened at 7 o'clock at night, and you couldn't just lean out the window and cover it. Uh, and so part of it, basically, it's, it's part of the, uh, it, it's also an American trait. While New York and L.A. tends to look inwards on themselves, we as a nation kind of do too because we don't really have to deal with Canada and Mexico on a regular basis as, as nations. The other reason is because I lived in England for a year, and it turns out that the Brits have a complaint about their media, which is they love the fact that they cover international news very, very well. They do not cover domestic news at all, period. They don't know anything about what's going on in their own country. They know everything about what's going on everywhere else. Europe does tend to cover their own uh, their incidents a lot better than than we would even pay attention to because it's just they're over there it's something going on, and and while you're absolutely right that it didn't happen all that long ago, as far as the American media public is concerned, it happened forever ago. That's like ten years, and since we haven't been directly involved in it, it didn't get much coverage at all. I mean, most Americans, I think, if you went around and asked them, couldn't tell you where the hell Yugoslavia is, and if I mean, if they ever knew who Slobodan Milosevic was, they've completely forgotten by this point. And uh, they'd much rather be watching about articles about what happened on Desperate Housewives last night on CNN's main page, for example. So it's absolutely wrong, but it's just that's just the way things work. So yes. We have the exact same thing in Canada with it being anything that's not centered around Toronto doesn't right. get covered. Yeah, and same deal. The rest deal. of Canada mm -hmm. hates Toronto because they think we think that the center of the universe yep. is Toronto. Um, similarly, the the thing that we have in the Canadian media that is not is not the case in uh, in the states is that any story about States will be comparing the states to Canada. Oh, is it? Okay. That's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's this whole like navel gazing security thing that Canadians have. Yeah, we've been actually been, on FARC, we've been trying to bump up our Canadian coverage because actually, proportionally speaking, we have more Canadians that read FARC. Our audience is basically 80% American, 10% Canadian. But if you compare the populations, that means per capita we have more Canadians reading FARC. So we're trying to cover the politics a little bit better. So. Yeah, because it's just as crazy as Florida most of the time. <laughs> you guys have more parties than people that get better better headlines, so it works out pretty good. Yes? Hey, um, can you comment on how uh, the power of Photoshop's affected, affected the news? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. That's one of the, the main ones that got out there was the guy that uh, he, he claimed that it was a, well, you've probably all seen it, the one where the computer from the 1950s with the steering wheel grafted onto the front of it, basically, and... <laughs> claiming that that was supposed to be something. Uh, actually, too, there haven't been too many of those that have actually gotten out, uh, but occasionally you'll see one. Um, I'm trying to think, because I know the AP got a hold of a Photoshop at one point. It wasn't from us, uh, but the AP ran one. Uh, in general, this is what's kind of weird. Everybody like, likes to complain about the AP because they're kind of particular and weird, but in general, they don't really get a lot of stuff wrong. Uh, in the, 
What's that? GI Joe. Oh yeah, the GI Joe thing. Yeah, that's a great example. Actually, that was in the AP. I, I just recently wrote an article for Wired on the top uh, 10 greatest internet hoaxes, and this is one most people forgot, but it was the GI Joe uh, doll thing where it's February of 2005 where they had captured an American soldier and they had a picture of the guy sitting there and there was a gun being pointed at his head. It was actually GI Joe, uh, and that was actually his own M16 that was being pointed at him off from off camera. And uh, that was mainstream news for about two hours until we popped it up and we have some toy collectors on FARC that are like, hey, wait a minute, that's Kung Fu Grip GI Joe right there. <laughs> And, and the reason that most people don't remember is because not only did that come off of CNN and Fox almost immediately when they read it, because those guys are on FARC all the time, it, they, they absolutely purged it out of like all memory. They, it's completely gone. So it was one of those things most people never got a chance to see because it's only about two hours old. So any other questions or comments about the American media? Because I could talk about this crap for days. Yes? Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, you sit there at the helm of, of you know, essentially the American media machine. So, so, you know, you get, you know, all the news that you can possibly handle, you know, through the FARC queue, but is there any other media that you regularly or even irregularly um, pay attention to that doesn't come in through the FARC queue? Yeah, actually, uh, somebody asked this last year, and it was kind of funny. It was one of the radio guys, um, and it was an interesting follow-up because I did, like, a, an hour-and-a-half drunken interview with them last night. And uh, he mentioned asking me the same question, and one of the ones I told him, and I said this last year, was there's a website called Stratfor. Uh, S-T-R-A-T-F-O-R dot com, and they're a political think tank. Uh, you have to, they have a free level that you can get where they'll spit an article out to you about every couple of weeks or so. Uh, I actually signed on for the pay version. They saw that I signed up for it and gave it to me for free because they all read FARC over there, uh, which is a little bit scary. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the analysis that these guys give out are incredibly detailed and very accurate because what these guys do is basically if you're a government or a corporation that wants to know about a political situation on the ground in a given country, you would call these guys up and basically hire them to give you a detailed analysis of what's going on. What I like about these guys is, is that they are basically making money by being right, and they're not partisan at all. Uh, they've run a few articles out the door that managed to basically piss off both sides of partisan readers that they've got, because occasionally they make mention of the fact that everybody's mad at them for something they wrote. Um, but they have some very, very interesting analyses, including um, like during the uh, war in Afghanistan, for example. They called every single facet of it before it occurred, all the way down to how it would end. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, they're not right all the time, but when they have to make a correction, they issue one. And what's interesting about that is recently they were talking about Iran. And on the Iran situation, they were talking about how uh, the guy who's the president, basically, the guy who uh, was talking about wiping Israel off the map you know, at a press conference just kind of mentioned that. Uh, they were talking about how he's a complete whack job. They said the bench over for Iranian politics is pretty thin. There's nobody left there. That's the guy they had to run up the flagpole to get him out there. And as a result, uh, they were thinking that they wouldn't have actually made him president unless they could control him. They've actually changed their minds recently. Now what they think is going to happen in Iran, and I unfortunately think they're absolutely right, is that they are predicting that Iran will provoke a survivable attack. That's what they think is going to happen next. I think they're dead on. Uh, they say that Iran's trying to arrest uh, leadership of the Muslim war from al-Qaeda, and the only way to do that is basically become the martyr. Provoke a survival attack, get your, you know, get your military installations bombed in 20 different areas, and, you know, oh, look at us, uh, the Jews and the Americans are hurting us, uh, everybody rally around us. That's what they think is going to happen next, and I think they're right. It's interesting to look at it from that perspective. Usually enough, too, they are completely unconcerned about North Korea. For the simple fact that uh, China is the most concerned about a nuclear North Korea, and they give North Korea all their oil. Uh, China has this interesting habit of they control the only pipeline into North Korea. Anytime the North Koreans start getting all wacky crazy, they cut it off. <laughs> and North Korea calls, I swear to God, this is all true. Then North Korea calls them up to ask them about it. Hey, why is our oil cut off? And they say, oh, it's a technical problem. And usually it's only for a day. Uh, but there was a time where basically there was a series of events where, I don't know, they said something. Chinese cut their oil off for a day and they calmed down. Then they turn it back on. They turn it back on. The North Koreans said something else. They shut it off for two days and then turn it back on. And then they did something else. And the Chinese, basically, this is where it all ended dead. They cut them off for a week because they wouldn't shut the hell up. And if you notice, it's been kind of calm over there lately. <laughs> it's a really interesting look at geopolitics from a more realistic perspective. And I really like that website. It's neat. Wow. What was the URL again? It's Stratfor, S-T-R-A-T-F-O-R dot com. It's fascinating stuff. So, Yes? Oh, yeah. Uh, right. You know, because you don't hear any 
mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. <coughs> I don't think it's going to change. Uh, I really don't. And I think what it would take to get anybody interested is American involvement. And again, it's more kind of an, it's, it's an insular kind of characteristic about American society, I think. It's just like we're very inward looking. We don't pay a lot of attention to that kind of stuff. Um, it's possible that somebody, uh, if we got a president in office that would actually masquerade against causes like that on a, on a, you know, on a got up and up basis, that that attitude might change. But I, I think in general, we're just kind of screwed on that. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is that what you're saying? Like, you yeah. Take something that major for we have to be actually involved in it in order to actually get involved in it. And it's, it's, it's sad but true. That's just, this is how it's going to go, unfortunately. I, I think the main reason, it's kind of like uh, occasionally you'll see people talk about, like, nobody goes to the opera anymore. Or nobody goes to museums anymore. Well, nobody ever did. That was definitely a high-class, you know, pursuit. Your average guy really didn't do that kind of thing. And... I'm going to have to think about this a little bit longer, but I'm, one, of, one of my little pet theories is I think that that's how people's kind of awareness of current events goes too, in that I think that most people really are just kind of placid and don't really care until that actually occurs. And that isn't necessarily even uh, what's going on with us is on a more international level too, like uh, Europe could probably give a, give a crap of what's going on in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, same kind of thing all over, I guess. So, but that's just, that's just my guess. I, I'm, I, I, I want to reserve the opportunity to change my mind later, however, because uh, the jury's not out on that yet. So, yes? Um, going along the same lines where you were saying that nobody goes to the opera anymore, nobody mm -hmm. goes to the museum anymore, um, the same problem, I think, kind of comes out in the media where, you know, you sort of have trouble sort of selling ideas to the average reader. I mean, you know, you said yes. yourself that most people probably can't mm -hmm. even point out on a map where Yugoslavia is. Right. Um, I can honestly say for myself that that's, um, something I experienced too when they were talking about that dictator that was recently captured in Africa from yeah Africa right mm -hmm. I can't identify on a map myself yeah you know so I mean do you see a way around the fact that you know media is going to have trouble you know selling these stories to the average reader to make them interesting mm -hmm. because if you can't tell where they are happening then you know why would the average reader care yeah that's it actually uh, interestingly um, uh, when I was in Moscow I was on that same trip I was over in, uh, in Norway <laughs> visiting Afton Posten. Uh, I was talking to Pravda about it because uh, they send a lot of traffic to us and vice versa because they're, they're really funny guys. But they were talking about how if they wanted to get a lot of traffic to any kind of a story, they have to run something about ghosts or aliens. <laughs> and like that gets all the traffic right there. And I said, or boobs. And they're like, yeah, well, the boobs thing was just kind of like, you know, that was obvious. <laughs> but the ghosts or the aliens thing, that was like, I mean, that's what they do. And Pravda will run some really strange stories, but it's, it, it occasionally it's because that's what gets people interested. Um, Afton Posten was telling me, that's the state newspaper in Norway. Um, not anymore, because they've got competition now, but back in the day it was. And they have a sister paper that the tabloid has 10 times the circulation they do. Uh, I think it's just human nature. I think it's just what we're interested in. We want to know what Tom Cruise is doing. We want to know, uh, you know whether Lindsay Lohan showed a boob recently. Uh, don't really care if they've captured any African dictators. And I, I think that's just uh, the way it goes. Um, the Afton Poston does not, but their tabloid, absolutely. Yes, they do. Yeah, because they're, they're all about the boobs over there in Norway. They love it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Two questions. Um, when, the Pope, when the Pope John Paul died, and that got major, major media coverage. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. curious about that. They, they could have had as easily done, oh, when Pope John Paul died in the Vatican, and maybe do a few small segments, but it's yeah. like, Mm -hmm. which I enjoyed watching, but why do you think they did that? I think because it played well uh, amongst people, and also, too, it was something that they could uh, uh, kind of move forward as an ongoing thing, you know, the whole, you know, who's going to win, kind of like the NCAA tournament, you know, that kind of thing. Also, too, it's like uh, the Hispanic community is mostly Catholic and is deeply interested in that, and that's a way to hit a demographic as well. Uh, I, I apologize if I sound kind of cynical about this kind of thing, but I don't think that a lot of this stuff happens in, for any other reason than they can generate dollars off of it. And I think that they knew that. I mean, there's a billion Catholics worldwide, so that's going to play per, to a pretty big audience. At least those guys will be interested, you know, as opposed to what happened in golf yesterday, which is, you know, getting a very small subset of the population. So I think that was the main thing. We have time for probably one more question. Okay, sounds good. Anybody got one? To, uh, shout out if you got a crazy one. Uh, you know what? You're probably right. I would, I would almost agree with that, yes. 
So one more. Yeah. Okay. So um, the boobies, you know, pretty much disappeared from the front page and then reappeared on some other website. Right. Can you sort of tell us, you know, the how the what happened to the boobies? We had advertisers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they're all around us. I don't know if you. Know. <laughs> The, the, the advertisers are basically complaining that they didn't want to advertise next to that stuff. Uh, I suspect that they were actually just making up excuses, kind of like when you're in junior high and you don't want to go out with somebody and tell them they're too tall. You know, you tell them something they can't change, and so that way you've got an excuse. That's my theory. Uh, I am not yet proven right or wrong on this, but at any rate, that was an excuse we were getting. So instead of letting them continue to use that, we just went ahead and I took a page from Gawker because Gawker does that. Two thirds of Gawker's traffic comes from Fleshbot. And I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, I mean, just send it over here. That'll work out pretty well. So that was basically the idea. So uh, are you saying that the, the advertising hasn't changed yet? So no, it hasn't. So if it doesn't eventually increase, will you move the boobies back? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you better believe it. Excellent. Yeah, if anybody else has any more questions, feel free to hit me. I'll be, like, walking around. I'll be in the bar probably most of the night. So just hit me. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it.